As we begin our time of worship now, I'd ask that you would stand with me. And I'm going to read a call to worship from Psalm 100. Hear these words from the 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles, we're going to be continuing to walk through 2 Samuel. We're in 2 Samuel chapter 14. We'll be reading the first 24 verses. You can find it in the Blue Pew Bible in front of you, starting on page 265. In 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. Now Joab, the son of Zeruiah, knew that the king's heart went out to Absalom. And Joab sent to Tekoa and brought from there a wise woman and said to her, Pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but behave like a woman who has been mourning many days for the dead. Go to the king and speak thus to him. So Joab put words in her mouth. When the woman of Tekoa came to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and paid homage and said, Save me, O king. And the king said to her, What is your trouble? She answered, Alas, I am a widow. My husband is dead. And your servant had two sons, and they quarreled with one another in the field. There was no one to separate them, and one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole clan has risen against your servant. And they say, Give up the man who struck his brother, that we may put him to death for the life of his brother whom he killed. And so they would destroy the heir also. Thus they would quench my coal that is left and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house and I will give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, On me be the guilt, my lord the king, and on my father's house. Let the king and his throne be guiltless. The king said, If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me and he shall never touch you again. Then she said, Please, let the king invoke the Lord your God, that the avenger of blood kill no more, and my son be not destroyed. He said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Please let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. He said, Speak. And the woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? For in giving this decision, the king convicts himself inasmuch as the king does not bring his banished one home again. We must all die. We are like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God will not take away life, and he devises means so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. Now I have come to say this to my lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid, and your servant thought, I will speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his servant. For the king will hear and deliver his servant from the hand of the man, who would destroy me and my son together from the heritage of God. And your servant thought the, Lord, the word of my Lord, the king, will set me at rest. For my Lord the king is like the angel of God to discern good and evil. The Lord your God be with you. And then the king answered the woman, Do not hide from me anything I ask you. And the woman said, Let my Lord the king speak. The king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman answered and said, as surely as you live, my lord the king, one cannot turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has said. It was your servant Joab who commanded me. It was he who put all these words in the mouth of your servant. In order to change the course of things, your servant Joab did this. But my lord has wisdom like the wisdom of the angel of God to know all things that are on the earth. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I grant this. Go, bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground and paid homage and blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord the king, in that the king has granted the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur, 
and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him dwell apart in his own house. He is not to come into my presence. So Absalom lived apart in his own house, did not come into the king's presence. Well, chapter 13 ends and 14 begins speaking of the fact that David's heart went out to his son Absalom. You remember Absalom uh, was exiled. He had fled because he had killed David's other son, Amnon. Well, David's heart goes out to him, and this phrase that his heart goes out to him is a little bit ambiguous in the original Hebrew. It's, it's a kind of ambiguous word that could actually and is often used to say against. So his heart is against Absalom. I think this is probably intentional. Um, this is something that you see regularly in Hebrew. It's a very poetic language. This actually tells us, I think, a bit about where David is at and why Joab does what he does in this story. What have we seen over and over about David? One of the things we've seen is that he is indecisive when it comes to making some of the most important decisions that he needs to make. So in this case, we see that he had a son, Absalom, who killed another son. What ought to be done? Well, he, he ought to show his judgment. Absalom ought to be put to death for what he's done. But that doesn't happen. And in fact, he's, he simply goes away. And David, it seems at the beginning of this story, he hasn't made a decision on what to do. He's indecisive about what to do. And this is complicated for uh, several different reasons. Uh, one is just the nature of what has happened, the nature of the crime that Absalom committed. Number two is the fact that Absalom is, at this point, the heir. He's the heir to the throne. But he has rebelled against David's house. He's rebelled against his own family in some way. And so you're left in this place of ambiguity, of not knowing how you would be able to proceed. What are you to do? It, we read these things from a distance, but this is all happening as a matter of political intrigue, right? In, in a, an earthly kingdom that at any moment could just fall apart because of these types of events. This is the kind of thing that could easily lead to the splitting of the kingdom. Indeed, we're going to see that that does happen for a time later on because Absalom is allowed to continue in this life, continue to be the same man that would be so hot-headed as to kill his brother. Joab, it seems, as often we see in these stories, and these stories, especially in, in First and Second Samuel, you see all of these elements of this political intrigue. It's, actually, it's fascinating as a story in itself. It's intriguing, right? It's, it's interesting how it all works, and it's real. I mean, it's, it's a real story. But what you have then is Joab, uh, the uncle of David, right, a commander of his forces. He's very much like the right-hand man, but also he's clearly at times stepping into the place of authority when David will not, when David's indecisive, and sometimes to a, in a way that he should not. We're going to see that time and again as well. But Joab steps in, and he makes the decision for David in a sense. He works in such a way to get David to make the decision that he wants. It's a somewhat deceptive way of doing it too, right? He goes to a woman, he, he tells her to go and deceive David, to convince him that she's in a position that would be much like the one that David is in and cause him to make a decision. Now in the context of 2 Samuel, where have we seen this kind of setup before? This happened very similarly in the case of David and Bathsheba when Nathan the prophet comes and speaks to David. But this is almost like an, an inverting of it because this is deceptive in a way that Nathan was not. Nathan comes and tells a story. This woman comes and intentionally deceives David. It's done in a way that the decision that David makes is not clearly one of heartfelt repentance, but it's it's a, a decision made according to his own longing that his son would maybe be closer again. It's made according to 
his indecisiveness, right? He, he basically allows the decision to be made for him rather than taking on the responsibility and the authority that was given to him by God. He really does kind of let it go to someone else. It doesn't turn out the way that the former story turned out. David should have taken responsibility for Absalom from the very beginning. And the fact that he's not willing to do that shows that there's starting to be these kind of, you know, cracks in his kingship. There's, there's these little cracks that are going to start to continue to break apart. Absalom being the major one. We're going to see that Absalom, in the end, will lead a revolt against his father. But even now that he's welcomed Absalom back, in a sense, from exile, he still says, well, he cannot come into my house. He still does not speak to Absalom. And even this, we seem to see in the story, the way that Absalom then receives that. Right? In this situation, David has not made the decision he should have at first. Now he's forced to make a worse decision. But even in that worse decision, he seems to make a bit of an indecisive one, where he doesn't actually go and see what he can do to help his son Absalom, the heir. Instead, he still keeps him far away. So everything just seems to be spiraling. The sin of David and the sins of Absalom as well, we're going to see that they're just going to keep growing. This is one of these things that uh, this story shows us is that sin, even when it's relatively small, seemingly small, when it is not repented of, when it's not dealt with, what happens is it it grows. It grows out of control, right? And it, it, it takes over, not just you, it doesn't just impact you, it actually goes beyond you. It goes out in such a way that it will destroy even those outside of you. And we see that here, the slow creeping sin as it's, as it's destroying David's earthly family. We're left with the need for it to be dealt with. Our New Testament scripture reading is from Romans chapter 11. If you want to turn there with me, you'll find in the Pew Bibles on page 947. We're going to start reading in verse 11 and read most of the chapter, stopping in verse 32. Did you hear the word of the Lord from Romans 11, beginning in verse 11? So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches." But if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, 
be grafted back into their own olive tree. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. This is God's holy and inerrant word for us this morning. The word of God has not failed in regards to Israel. That's what Paul's been explaining in chapters 9 to 11 up to this point. Even though many in Israel rejected Jesus, God was still at work fulfilling his promises. He was working out his purpose of election. He was declaring his power and mercy. And as Jim preached last week, he even still had a remnant within Israel, even in Paul's day, a remnant that Paul was a part of in which he was working in. Now, today in Romans 11, Paul continues to say the word of God has not failed. It has not failed in regards to Israel. And in the case of Israel, he's not done. He's not finished. In fact, he is going to continue to work out his plan for the corporate body of Israel as his mercy continues to work out throughout all the world. Now, what I want to do, uh, this, is a, you know, this is a well-known passage for being difficult, right? There's, there's no way that by the end of this sermon you'll think, I'm glad all my questions are answered about this text. That's just not possible for us. But what I want to do is kind of tap into a couple of main themes, main threads within this text that we can pull out of it and see. Specifically, I want to look at the character of man, or what I'm calling the character of man. What does this text say about what our character, the character of man, should be? See what it teaches about the character of God, and also something that it says about the character of the future. I don't know that this is the best way to break it down, but it's one way that I think you'll be able to remember some of these main themes throughout this text, not get too bogged down in some of the details, which are important and good, but that you see kind of the, the wider picture of the text. We ought to humble ourselves in light of the kindness and severity of God and also trust that he's going to continue to work out his purposes in the world even when we don't see it. So we start then with what this says to the character of man. And what I mean by the character of man is what, what is this calling for in us? What kind of character does it call forth in us? This passage calls forth a certain character in us as a response to how God has worked. Specifically, it calls for humility and faith or trust. Read with me again verse 11. So it says, I ask did they stumble in order that they might fall? This is speaking of Israel, remember. So did Israel stumble that they might fall? By no means. Think about how often Paul has used that phrase. By no means. This is the strongest negation that he can use. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? All right, God's promise has not failed or it has not fallen. God's word has not fallen. And even Israel has not fallen, at least not completely. Right? It's not the end of Israel in other words. If you have an image of God in your head as a God who's just waiting around to catch you in some sin, to catch you when you fall or screw up, to finally get the chance to condemn you or something like that, that's simply not what the Scripture speaks of, right? God is patient. He is slow to anger. 
even in the stumbling of Israel, which was massive. Right? When you think about the history of redemption, Christ himself came in the flesh. Paul spoke of this in Romans 9, remember. Christ came, he dwelt among them, right, in person. And he was crucified for it. Right? This is massive. This is not, this is not little. Right? They stumbled. But he's saying they did not stumble in order that they might fall. In other words, that it's not over for this people. Think of the book of Acts and the way that this speaks. Right? It speaks to the same thing. Paul is saying they did not fall just to fall. It's not, it's not over for them. And the purpose in their stumbling was not just, just judgment. It was also that the mercy of God might go to the Gentiles. Right? The riches of God's mercy. Remember back to Romans 9. Pharaoh is hardened by God. Why? So that he can make known the riches of his mercy. Right? That's happening at the same time. This is the same thing that's happened now with Israel, he says. You see this in the book of Acts. As Israel is hardened, what do they do? They persecute believers. They persecute the church. Right? It's, it's the, the zealous and religious Jews that chase the Christians out of Jerusalem. But that happens in order to fulfill the purpose of God stated at the beginning of the book of Acts that the gospel would go from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. And so the people of God are persecuted because of the hardness of heart of the Israelites, but it leads to the gospel going from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. For Israel... It says that the inclusion of Gentiles, like the, the non-Jewish nations who are accepting the gospel, says this is in order to make them jealous. So this is also part of the purpose of God. Not that it's the end for them as a corporate body, but that God isn't, he's not done, he's still working. And even in their rejection, he's going to use the reception of the gospel amongst the nations to make them jealous. Think about throughout the Old Testament, the way that it speaks of God and his relationship to Israel. It's the relationship of a marriage. Right? God has covenanted to this people, Israel, the nation of Israel, and they turned out to be a, an unfaithful wife. They broke covenant with him time and time again. And it says throughout the Old Testament that it caused God to become jealous of them, jealous of their worship and their affection. Now, we think of jealousy as almost always negative, right? There's ways in which jealousy can be sinful. But obviously, for God, this is not a sin. This jealousy, at times, is the right response. Imagine a, a husband whose wife is going out with other men, and he just, doesn't, he just doesn't care. That's not right. There's something deeply wrong about that. Right? A husband is to be jealous for the... the covenanted affection of his spouse. This is what God is like. And throughout the Old Testament, Israel continues to make God jealous until finally you get to a point where God now says, fine, I will cast you off. I will divorce you in a sense, and I will take another. But this is just an image, right? Don't get bogged down in the analogy. But he's not doing that because it's over for Israel. He says, actually, this is in part to make Israel jealous. That Israel is going to see what God is doing for the nations, and in the end, it will help to lead them back to Christ out of their hard-heartedness. And if they are to be included, if, if the judgment upon them meant riches for the world, what does Paul say? How much, how much greater is it going to be when they're included again? This will be tremendous. It'll be amazing. Verse 13, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. So notice, this is, this is the audience for this. Paul is speaking specifically to Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. You see that Paul, as an apostle to the Gentiles, he sees what God is doing, 
He says, look, this is what God is doing. God is making Israel jealous by the gospel going to the nations. So he says, so that's what I do, right? He follows after how God works and says, this is how I work in my ministries. I seek to make them jealous in some way that I might win some of them even now. He wanted his fellow Israelites to believe. And he knew that God was still at work in them, that he could still save some of them. He believes that in part because Israel was chosen by God, that there was a particular blessing that God had given to them. God's choosing of Abraham and his offspring meant nothing for their justification, right? Paul's been over that, right, time and again. Their physical lineage from Abraham did not matter in terms of being justified, right? Everybody has fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody is under the dominion of sin, and everybody needs a savior, it doesn't matter, Jew, Gentile, it just, it doesn't matter who you are, that's the case. Paul has made that clear. So he's not saying here, oh, actually, I'm taking back what I said before. No, he's, he's saying that there's another category of which to think about things that we're not just talking about in terms of justification, but there was a way in which God gave particular blessings to the physical people of Israel. He's spoken of that again at the beginning of Romans 9. He spoke about it throughout this book so far. That there were blessings that they had that were blessings from God, true blessings. Because of God's blessing, they still, in some sense, were to be viewed as holy, as set apart. They're different, right? There's something different uh, about them than the rest of the nations. God isn't done with this people that he had given so much blessing to. And there might be individuals within the nation in Paul's day that had rejected Christ to such an extent that there was no hope. But he's speaking corporately. He's not speaking about individuals here. He's he's saying corporately speaking, God isn't done with this nation, just like he's not done with all the rest of the nations. And if their rejection of the gospel led to reconciliation, he says, how much more when they believe? What will this look like when such a hard-hearted, stiff-necked, obstinate people receives the truth? by and large, right, corporately, meaning a large portion of them, right, becomes definitive in some way of them. What, what will that do? What will that look like? He says it'll be like life from the dead, right? It'll be spectacular. It'll be this, this miracle of God in history. Just imagine what that would be like. And you don't have to just imagine it because we have a, a picture of it in Paul himself. Think of the Apostle Paul. He's He is an apostle like one untimely born because he was a a zealous Israelite, right? A Pharisee of Pharisees. And he persecuted the church. He took a major role as we're talking about the book of Acts and how the gospel progresses through persecution. He was at the head of some of that persecution. And yet, his conversion, it was like life from the dead. It It was so tremendous that people didn't know what to do with it at first. And it led to tremendous missionary work, churches planted all over the Gentile world. It led to uh, most of the New Testament being written, right? This is, I think, a picture for us of what he's talking about. This is what God can do even in a stiff-necked and hard-hearted people. This is what revival can look like. Verse 17, but, he says, if some of the branches were broken off and you, remember, he's speaking to Gentiles, And you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Paul makes it clear that a reception into the kingdom of God is not a reason to boast. It's not a reason to be arrogant. Paul warns Gentiles, right, and that speaks to us, that we should not think of our inclusion into the people of God as a reason to think higher of ourselves than others. God didn't give the gospel to us because he saw us and thought there's something more special about that person, right? There's something really great about that. 
That's not how it worked. He decided out of the freedom of his will to love that which was unlovable. No, Paul says that rather Gentiles being added in, Gentiles were like a wild olive tree, an uncultivated olive tree. If you've ever uh, done any work looking at, uh, you know, any kind of fruit-bearing tree, but look at where it came from, right? So you, you do the history on, okay, well, what was a wild olive like? You might see this in other ways. You might come across, you know, wild fruit-bearing trees uh, when you're hiking or something, but it's, they're inedible because of what they are. If you look, I've seen, uh, I've read some on the history of things like bananas, uh, avocado, strawberries, all of these things that we think of as these, you know, these great fruits. If you look at what they originally were, they're almost all seed, almost no fruit, and oftentimes they were inedible. And it was only through a long, careful process of cultivation by people that they became what we now have as these, you know, delicious fruits. It it took time, it took work, it took effort to get them to that point. This is what Paul's saying about the Gentiles versus Israel. He's saying, look, you as Gentiles, you were, you're an uncultivated wild olive tree, right? There's it's not fruitful, it's not beneficial, right? Nobody has taken the time to carefully cultivate you in a certain direction of fruitfulness. But Israel was cultivated in this way, right? Israel has been cultivated in such a way that they are fruitful. But some of the branches of Israel have now become unfruitful. And what do you do with those? Well, you you cut them off. And in this case, he says that you've been grafted in, you've been added into the people of Israel. The nations, the Gentiles, this is what they were like before the advent of Christ. This is what we were like, uncultivated, unfruitful. But now we've been grafted into the people of God, with Abraham as our father as well, by faith. And so we inherit the benefits of the commonwealth of Israel. We're brought into all of those blessings of this cultivated tree. Paul's point is that this is no reason to boast, right? It's no reason to think higher of yourself, of your people than others, because it's a gift, right? It's all been given to the church. Yes, some branches, he says, were broken off that you might be grafted in, but they were broken because of what? Unbelief. We've been united to Christ by faith, not by works, right? You didn't graft yourself into this tree, Right? That had to be done by someone else. What does it say then? It says, so do not become proud, but fear. This is the character that God's work in this world calls forth in us. Right? When, we, when we think about the history of redemption, what should we respond with? It's humility and fear. Seeing the judgment of God on others It's not reason to build yourself up, thinking more highly of yourself. Rather, it's a reminder that you should also fear, that we also face God's judgment if we reject the truth as they did. This is particularly, again, speaking of corporate bodies. There's ways that we can apply it analogically, more individually, but it's it's speaking corporately, right, of of covenanted peoples, of, of groups, of nations. Simply because a people group or a nation receives the truth or is a majority Christian does not mean that God will never cast that nation off. We see that through the history of the world, don't we? The Christian heritage of our nation, for instance, is not reason to think that God will not judge us. If anything, it's reason to believe that he will judge us all the more. Right? If God did not spare the nation of Israel, that he directly and specifically and carefully cultivated, how much less would he keep us and not cast us off and not cut us off if we were to reject him in the truth? Throughout the history of the church, this has come up. And I think that there's some of this going on in Paul's day. Um, He's probably seen some, uh, and we know throughout the New Testament, this kind of division between Jews and Gentiles and how to think of one another how to 
see one another. We know that there were times when the Jews in the church held themselves up in pride over the Gentiles being brought in, as if they were closer to God because of things like circumcision, the law of Moses, things like this. I think Paul in part is probably dealing with another problem, which would be the Gentiles proudly exalting themselves over the Jews in the church. And he's saying that's not, that doesn't work, right? You can't, you can't do that. Throughout the history of the church, there have been times when uh, the Christian church does this toward Israel or toward Israelites, the Jewish people, right? They are Christ killers, it said. And that's not wrong as a bare fact. What Paul is saying is not, yet Israel didn't reject Christ. No, he's saying they rejected Christ. And so did you, right? If it were not for the grace of God, you also are responsible for the death of Christ. It's your sin that put him on the cross. The same thing is going on. God has been gracious to Jews and Gentiles. And to think yourself better than another, whether it be uh, in terms of Gentile Jew or any other kind of grouping that we might try to make, it just, it doesn't work. Pride can never be the response to the grace of God, not if it's properly understood. Humility is the proper response. Right? Humble yourself. Recognize that God does not have to bless this nation. He doesn't have to bless this church. Right? He doesn't have to bless our denomination. Right? He, he does as he pleases. And if we reject him, he does not have to continue to be gracious, though he often is. God shuts both Gentiles and Israelites up in unbelief. Throughout the history of the world, you see this, right? I mean, all peoples at times are, are in a place of unbelief, of rejecting the light as it comes into the world. Why does he do that? Why is God working it out that way? Why does he do this? He does it to proclaim the riches of his mercy and to show that this is not of you. This is not something that mankind did. Right? We were not able to build the tower to the heavens. Right? It didn't work. That didn't keep us from the judgment of God, and it never does when we try to do it. Right? God is declaring through history, through the rising and falling of nations, through the gospel going out and the gospel being taken away, he is declaring something about himself. And so we get to the, the character of God. What does this speak about the character of God? Verse 22, note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? This is what God is doing. He is declaring something about his character. He's, he's describing something about himself in his kindness, and his severity. This isn't talking about individuals. Remember that again. Be careful as you approach this. This is not talking about individuals because Paul's gone over the fact that the love of God given to his elect, it cannot be taken away, right? Those who are justified will be glorified, right? The love of, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's not speaking about individuals who he has placed his love upon. He's speaking about corporate bodies. He's speaking in terms of historical, visible developments. And in the history of redemption, God is, is making known these things about himself, the kindness and severity of his character. His severity is seen as he cuts off those branches of his visible people that reject him, those that visibly profess him but then reject the truth. He cuts them off. It's not enough to claim historical connection to God, right? It wasn't enough for the Jews to say, Look, our lineage comes from Abraham, right? We're his, his physical flesh and blood. That wasn't enough. It doesn't matter, right? The same thing is true in other ways, right? It's not enough to say, well, we're a Christian nation. Not if you reject the truth. Not if you reject the Christ. That doesn't matter. Historical connection does not mean that you're safe from God's judgment. This is God's severity 
right? His judgment. It's a warning to us. God is not a plaything, right? He's not a dog that you get to teach to do tricks. He's not something that you get to add to your life to fulfill it a little bit more, right? Just another commodity that maybe adds something that you want to your life. You can kind of take it or leave it. Right? God is all in all. All of this is for him. All of creation and history is the theater of his glory. He is everything. God will cut us off just as Israel if we follow in their hardness of heart. If we turn inward, if our hearts become hardened against him. However, even though this makes known his severity toward those who are in unbelief, it also makes known his kindness at the same time. Even his severity and judgment is seen through all this as something that he uses for his kindness. This is what he's been working through uh, from chapter 9 until now, as we read these words, that, that God in his judgment continues to work out his mercy, continues to work out his kindness. He hardens that he might make known his mercy. He's slow to anger, but he abounds in steadfast love. He is long-suffering with those who are hard of heart. And so even if Israel has rejected him, he can still graft them back in, he says. Or he can still be patient. He's still ready to forgive any who would repent and turn once again to him. If the Gentiles, being wholly removed from God, can be saved, if they can be grafted in with no former knowledge of God in any way, with no cultural, uh, earthly connection where they might come to know him, right, without the law in their midst, read regularly, if they can be saved, how much more are those who have then gone on to reject him but still have some of those earthly blessings? If God is able to save an outright pagan tribe, right, a, a missionary goes, frontline missions, goes to those who have, have zero basis in the gospel. And yet, we know many stories of people in this situation being saved and being brought into the kingdom of God. If he can do that, how much can he also bring back apostate churches? How much can he also bring back those who have had the truth but rejected him over time? He can still do it, right? There may be a particular judgment upon those who have had his truth but rejected it, and yet he's still able. There's still hope. It's not over. Those churches, for instance, that have rejected Christ, but they still read out loud the truth of the gospel in their liturgies, well, there's still hope there, right? There's still light there. There's still something that God can take and cause one little spark to turn into a great flame. And uh, those that have had a history in the visible people of God, there's a sense in which they would much more easily than fit back into the visible people of God. It would be more natural, is what Paul says. This is how he speaks of Israel. There, there is no corporate body of people that are so far from Christ that they're beyond hope. Right? That's one of the points. It's, right, God says that he is going to save people from every tribe, every people, every nation, every language. Right? He's going to have his people in the new heavens and new earth. So even when it looks like to us, when we look out in our day, and we look out at the world and we see things a certain way, when we see the judgments of God on the world, on various nations and various peoples, right? we might think, oh, it's over for them. This, I think, teaches us, no, it, may not be. God does as he wishes, and he's going to save his people wherever they may be. He will by no means clear the guilty, right? God is a judge. He is severe, it says. He will cut off the faithless, but he will also show kindness. He will show mercy to those in humble faith. That's the kind of God he is, right? That's, that's how he is revealing himself to us to be. And this, I think, then leads Paul into speaking uh, something about the character of the future. He speaks to the future in a, 
what God is going to do even in the people of Israel. Verse 25, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul's been speaking about his present day, right? What's going on in his day? What do you see? When when you're looking from Paul's own perspective, what do you see? Well, you see Israel, by and large, has rejected the truth. It seems as though the judgment upon them is it. You know, maybe some here and there will be saved, but it looks over for these people as a whole. But God is not done with the ethnic people of Israel. I think sometimes maybe uh, in, due to, you know, the rise of dispensationalism and maybe our, our, our desire to kind of, you know, get away from that, sometimes we want to think that, you know, every time the New Testament speaks about Israel, well, it's just speaking about the church, which is true a lot of the time. Right? That is true a lot of the time. But here Paul speaks of actual, the corporate body of Israel, not the modern nation state, right? That's a, just a new development in history. That's not what Paul's talking about because it didn't exist in his day. But he's talking about the the corporate people of Israel as opposed to the Gentile nations, right? So he's speaking of this corporate body, and he's saying that there's there's something true of them that is yet to come, that is still coming. He calls it a mystery. Uh, Whenever mystery is mentioned in the New Testament, uh, mysteries are something that they, they need revelation to be understood, there are some things that you can just look out at the world and you can just know, right? You can learn just by nature, you can know. So for instance, another place that Paul uses this word is in Ephesians 5 when he speaks about marriage. He says, I, I want you to know this mystery, that uh, marriage refers to Christ in the church. So he says that marriage is a picture of the gospel. Now when you look out at the world, when you look out at nature itself, you can tell that there is something diff- different about men and women, You can tell that there are particular roles that they fit into well. You can, uh, even just by nature, marriage is something that comes naturally to people. Now there's, you know, differences in how it plays out, but but by and large, if you look at any time in the history of the world, marriage of some kind was there, right? A a covenanting between a man and a woman. It It was there. So there's elements of marriage, of the place of men and women in marriage, that you can just know by nature. But you can't look out in the world and see that the relationship between a husband and a wife is about the gospel, right? Is about the the covenant love of Christ to the church and the church's humble and submissive response to that love. You can't know that just on your own. That's something that God had to reveal. It was a mystery that had to be made known by God. So a mystery is something that you can't just know right? You, you need revelation. Paul says, here's another mystery, right? Here is something that needs to be made, made known. Somebody has to tell you. You wouldn't just know this, right? You can't know that this is going to happen, but here is this mystery. Paul reveals something about Israel's future that we wouldn't otherwise know. It's not specific, right? This isn't the kind of thing where you get a text like this and you pull out, you make a chart, you know, a timeline of, you know, if this happens on this day, then this is going to happen on these days, right? It doesn't give a timeline exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't give any specific details, right? It's very general, which is often the nature of future prophecies. But still, he says that there is still something that's going to happen to these people, to Israel, who have rejected Christ. It's, it's not over for them, Right? They, they've rejected Christ, they've been hardened of heart, but as a corporate body, that's only going to be until, he says, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Now, it doesn't have to mean every single Gentile believer that will ever live is going to come in, and then all of a sudden there's going to be a revival amongst the ethnic people of Israel. Uh, what it means is that there is a, a number of Gentiles that need to come in, and then God is going to work this revival amongst this people. And in one way, if you meditate upon the character of God as he has revealed it, so far in Romans 11, this fits, right? It makes sense with his kindness and severity. 
Of course God isn't done with them. Right? How could God throw off the people that he had blessed so much with his law, with uh, the calling, with this general corporate adoption and election that's spoken of at the beginning of chapter 9, with the patriarchs, with the prophets? No, Israel will be saved in the same way that every other nation is going to be saved, in that God is going to save his people out of them. As Christ fills all in all, as the Great Commission continues to be accomplished. Verse 28, he says, As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. In Paul's day, it looked like God was finished with this people, and that culminated in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. But Paul says that God still has a plan, even for the salvation of Israel. As the gospel was on the move, the Jews generally, Paul himself even, were enemies of the truth. They were enemies of the gospel. They persecuted the church. They persecuted believers. But in regards to their corporate election, not individually, but corporately, right, as a nation that God had given so many blessings to and a special favor to, they were still beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Right? You, can, you can imagine being in a position in Paul's day where you see such hardness of heart that they would persecute you, that they would kill you, that they would, uh, you know, chase you out of town and thinking, yeah, there's no hope here, right? You would say the same probably of many uh, nations and places that the gospel has gone. You probably would have said it about uh, Western Europe at one point, right, where you have pagan barbarians. You would have said it about Ireland at one point, which became a bastion of Christianity. You would have said there's no hope for them, right? They would just kill anybody that came witnessing to them. And yet here we are, right? Historically, the way it developed is that for a time anyway, the gospel went forward in this place. Paul's saying that you, it might look this way, right? They're enemies according to the gospel right now, right? But in terms of what God is doing, it's not over for this corporate people. Even if Paul isn't specific about uh, what it's going to look like, right, what, what exactly this will look like, he says that just as the gospel has gone out to the Gentile nations, it's going to return to the nation of Israel, right? And this will be of great benefit. He's already said this will be like life from the dead. This will be, this will be good for the whole world. And why has God done this, right? When you look out at the history of the world and the way that God has chosen for his kingdom to grow, for the gospel to go forward, for people to be saved. It's not, it's not as though everything just happened instantly, right? Could God have sent missionaries to save the entire people of the whole world all at once in the first generation of believers? He could have, couldn't he? So why not? What, what is he doing then? What is God doing in this plan of salvation for the Gentile nations, for the nation of Israel? Well, he has shut up all in sin so that he might make known his mercy. Right? All nations, when it, when it says all, it's, it's speaking of, of corporate bodies still. That's the context, right? So it's, you know, he has given all up into their sin. All nations, all peoples, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, but he has given all up into sin so that he might have mercy on all, so that his mercy might be declared and made known everywhere that sin has reigned. The fullness of each nation will be brought into the kingdom of God in history. And all of this is to, to declare the mercy of God. So where does that leave us? It leaves us, once again, then, with the character of God, with our response, then, to the character of God. We should not give up on anyone. We should be patient, long-suffering with those who we believe God has rejected. 
We should not be the kind of people that look out at the world, we see God's judgments, which are severe, and we may even live through God's judgments, which are severe, but that should not cause us to be pessimistic about the way that God is working in the world, right? That shouldn't make us think, well, everybody that I see, they, they're beyond hope. We should not be pessimistic about God and what he's able to do. Our God is the God who raises the dead. And when his judgment is made known in history, knowing his kindness should help us to remember that in some way he is going to make known his mercy. He's going to use this for the benefit of his kingdom. And that takes faith, right? You can't always just see how he's going to do that. Right? It takes actual faith. You weren't there when Jesus rose from the dead you believe it. You know it to be true because you believe or you have faith. In the same way, we, we need to continue to have that humble faith, reliance upon God, knowing that he is going to build his kingdom, how he sees fit. It's not going to follow exactly how we want him to do it, how we think he should do it, because he's God and we're not. But we should be able to humbly trust what he's doing in the world. The resurrected Jesus Christ continues to reign and he will do as he sees fit. So humble yourself, fear God, trust that he will build his kingdom. Even where it seems like the rejection is the fiercest, he will build his kingdom. The gates of hell will not prevail. Would you pray with me? Father God, we're grateful that you have not left us in a place of unknowing, but that you have revealed things to us. We admit that there are many things in your word, uh, things in this chapter that are difficult for us to understand, that we are uh, not always capable of grasping all that you've given us. But we pray that as we've read your word, as we've, we've walked through it carefully, as we've tried to understand it, that you would uh, take away those things that I've said that uh, may not be true to your word, but that your truth as it has been proclaimed, that you would take that, the seed of your word, that you'd plant it deep in our hearts, that you would cultivate it, that you would water it by your spirit, that you would help it to grow up and produce much fruit, and that you would continue that work in your kingdom, in this world, that as you send your gospel forward, that you would continue to draw more to yourself, that we would trust you, that we would not despair in your judgment, but know that even in your judgment, you remain merciful. We pray this in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.